again and welcome to Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. I'm your host, certified sex therapist Lori Watson, author of Wanting Sex Again, and blogger at Psychology Today and WebMD. And I have with me Dr. Adam Matthews, my co-host, who's a couples therapist, psychotherapist, and president of NCAMFT. Foreplay is dedicated to helping couples keep it hot. Each episode, we cover an aspect of sex that impacts your sex life and something that you can relate to. So if you find our discussions helpful, please give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. We would love it if you would tell a friend about us. You can find us also on the web at foreplayrst.com. And if you have a comment or a topic that you'd like us to talk about, we'd love to hear from you. Please send them to us at info at foreplayrst.com. Thanks for listening. Now on to today's topic. So today we're going to talk about basically the breakdown in paradise, you know, kind of what what that toxic sexual and relationship dynamics are that cause the marriage or the relationship to go astray. And I had a quote that I really liked. I found it on Twitter. By the way, I'm on Twitter and you're on Twitter. Right? I'm on Twitter. I'm Ask Lori Watson. What are you? At Matthews Council. Okay, good. At Matthews Council. One T in Matthews, everybody. One T. (laughs) One T. And yes. And we also have a foreplay RST uh, Twitter account, which we don't do that much on yet. We will. But this quote I found on Twitter was by Dr. Sue Johnson, and she's the EFT guru. She really Mm -hmm. talks about attachment in her theories. And she says, when marriages fail... It is not increasing conflict that is the true cause. It is decreasing affection and emotional responsiveness. Wow, there's so much to that. What's your first reaction to to when she says that? I mean, I I find it so hopeful. Yeah. Right, because so many people come in and say, I want to stop fighting. I want there to be not any conflict. And, you know, with two separate beings, it's impossible to have a conflict-free relationship. Oh, not yeah, not only that, I think... We see conflict as a bad thing when, in fact, conflict drives intimacy. It does. I mean, it you does. have to go through conflict to have any sort of emotional truth. intimacy. True. I like that truth, just true intimacy. Right. And so conflict is not something to be avoided. We have to do it well. We have to do yes. it in the right way. But conflict, when people come in and say, I want to, if they say I want a conflict-free relationship, I think uh, that's kind of pie-in-the-sky thinking and not yeah. helpful. Yeah, yeah. A, a conflict-free relationship would not be a good relationship. Right. And I think to avoid conflict is the not doing. Okay. I'm going mm. to try to not trigger my partner versus this is something that felt to me like it, it's something that you can do, mm. which is affection and being responsive and attentive. I, another um, marriage therapist out there, Dr. John Gottman, right? Yeah. I mean, he talks about bids. Yeah. A, a bid for attention is... When your partner says, hey, you know, you're at the breakfast table and you go, hey, look at that cardinal at the bird feeder. Mm. You know, the partner who puts the paper down or the computer down for a second, right, or the mm. phone down and looks up and looks at the bird feeder and says, oh, yeah, that is beautiful. Mm. That's connection. Oh, I mean, yeah. it's so simple. It's like I attended to what you say, you know, what you said to me. I paid it some attention. I noticed what you noticed in the world, and therefore we are connected yeah. versus maybe the grunt, you know, yeah. like, look at that beautiful cardinal and no response or, oh, uh, you know, I mean, yeah. or, or right, the partner who flirts and says, oh, you know, did you, did you, you know, you're looking hot tonight yeah. and the partner says nothing yeah. or they, you know, kind of brushed away, oh, quit it, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's not attending to. Not right now. That's not attending to the bid, yeah. right, for some sort of attention. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to drop and do it right there, but it could be like, hey, thanks, you yeah. know, or some response. Yeah, and and I think when when there's a high amount of that, when, as Dr. Johnson's saying, when there is a great deal of affection and a great deal of emotional connectiveness there, when there is conflict, you have something to fall back on. Yes. Right? It's not yes. going, it's not threatening the relationship. But I think one of the things about conflict that freaks a lot of couples out is that there is no affection. They don't have a bank of I love you's to fall back on or a bank of, as you're talking about, bids that have been successful. Yeah. And so they end up, it is any kind of conflict is relationship threatening. Yes. Right? And And it becomes... There's just nothing there to that it's not safe to have conflict. Yes. Right? And I I think that that's the problem with sexlessness or mm. a low sexed marriage is sex is something that feathers the nest, right? It yes. makes it a soft place to land. It's like, yeah, okay, we had this big fight, but the weekend's coming. 
we're going to go out together, we're going to make love, and there's going to be this sense of reunion, Mm -hmm. or I want to get over the fight because I want to have that (laughs) reunion, you know? Yeah, that's right. You have a reason to because you know know that it's coming. Yeah, we're going to have something to fall back on. I, I think that affection is something that is separate from and a part of sex. And so many people, I think in particular, uh, affection can go offline because one person says, oh, he only starts touching me when he wants sex. Mm. And so he's like, okay, I, I'm just not going to touch you anymore then because mm. you're going to misconstrue it. Or or he'll say, well, I do get aroused when I touch you and I can't really help that. And And it's a crazy thing to stop affection, I think, in a relationship. Mm. Or maybe one person comes into it more avoidant, right? They didn't come from a childhood that has deep affection. And so they find it really hard to be affectionate. Yeah. You know, just the natural thing. You're sitting next to your partner and you put your head on their shoulder or you put your arm, you know, around them or hand mm. on their leg or so- something about some people are kind of missing that gene. Yeah. You know, their their childhoods were not amply affectionate sure. usually. I mean, the good thing about that is if they do marry a person who has a good sexual drive, is oftentimes it can be healed because with enough affection and sex drive, they they get comfortable with it. And they, Mm -hmm. I think we do actually desperately need affection, all of us, even as children. But when it doesn't come, we we take like this inner vow that says, I won't need it. Yeah. And then, you know, sex out of this affectionless relationship is harder. Yeah. You know, for both people. And you're talking about affection, though, in terms of touch, and I'm wondering if there are other forms of affection that could happen that might equate, especially to people that t- that that you're talking about that maybe touch wasn't big for them in their mm-hmm. in their family, but maybe mm-hmm. encouragement and positive words were mm-hmm. appreciation appreciation. Mm-hmm. Maybe I had an older male mentor who would always tell me that sex starts in the kitchen, right? Uh-huh. And what he meant by that is that, he had to do the dishes every night. Like he meant like, <laughs> like when, when he when he did that, <laughs> when he took care of, of the dishes, it spoke to his wife in a way yes. that was powerful. Yes. Right. It it like it wasn't just that he could hug her, but if she looked over his shoulder and saw a sink full of dishes, mm-hmm. like that Forget it. Forget it. Like I mean it yeah. was just it it was her to do list was still going. That's right. Yeah, I, I mean I had a patient this week and and they are having a difficult time sexually and you know and he had made an agreement to do the dishes every mm-hmm. night and i said so did you do that and he's like oh well only when i remembered i'm like wait 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 yeah. we had an agreement not yeah. just you and your wife you and i had an agreement yeah. to help you get better and and you know he's like he just didn't see the relevance of that to their sex yeah. life but she was a, a type of person just like you said who mm. she had a big to-do list and he really did not help nearly much around mm. the house. And they were both working full time. I, I just thought it was so unfair. And he was like, oh, you know, my standards are just it can be kind of clean enough to be happy and dirty enough or clean enough to be healthy, mm. dirty enough to be happy. I, You know, she's but she didn't really seem like she was obsessive to me. Yeah. I mean, she just wanted the dishes done so that when she came in to fix dinner the next night, mm-hmm. which she was the one always fixing dinner, you know, that it was ready to go. Yeah. I, I was just thinking, I, I mean, sometimes people are so caught in the power struggle that they don't do what's obvious. Yeah. You know, like what's uh, right in front of them. And I, I really make it better. I really appreciate this conversation, Lori, because I'm, I'm remembering that I need to take out the trash as soon as I get home tonight. Oh, my God, I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, yes. Ma- Adam. It's piling Matthews, up. Matthews, <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> Dr. M. Uh, I know. I think what we're talking about, there, these these can be lots of different things. I mean, we're talking about kind of logistics, like chores and, and different things like this. But I think there's just lots of things like you're talking about in that power struggle that we make a, explicit promises to do with each other mm-hmm. and, and, and ways that we communicate affection to our partner. Sure. That, well, I think you're talking about love language. I, I oh, mean, to yeah. me, I suppose... Affection to me is more about touch, but I think you're talking about can we feed and nurture our partner in their particular love language, right? Uh, 
yeah. if it's touch or sexual touch or if it's what you know help words or, yeah help help words service. of appreciation yeah quality um, I think quality time is another quality one. time and yeah. I think gift giving gift is giving one too, yeah which always seems so mercenary but I have finally understood that yeah that I think you know when you're going on a business trip and there's a bouquet of flowers that sits on the corner of the counter it's like you're there yep you know it creates a constancy of presence you know or she's wearing the earrings that you gave her. And it not necessarily the diamond earrings, but the ones that you know you liked, she liked, or something. It's it's a physical, tangible reminder of our connection. I think it's presence of mind as well that mm-hmm. you know that you are present on your partner's mind that they are actually exactly. thinking about you. Yeah. So send the flowers after you've gone, not before you've gone. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Take out the trash before you leave for work, not after. But I think all of this is what you said, I'm thinking about my partner. My partner Mm -hmm. is in my mind. That's a way to build the relationship, giving each other in their love language, affection Mm -hmm. and responsiveness, right? Attentiveness to them is a way that basically sets the stage for a better sexual life. And sex in and of itself also sets the stage. It's part of affection. It's not just downplaying conflict certainly like you said finding a way to have a fair fight yeah you know that isn't destructive to the person of our partner yeah. uh, but can talk about the differences between us okay well we'll be back in a minute this is foreplay radio sex therapy with sex therapist Lori watson and dr adam matthews be right back Wanting Sex Again, How to Rediscover Desire and Heal a Sexless Marriage by Certified Sex Therapist Lori Watson. Each chapter is designed to fix one of the problems that cause low libido from early marriage through the childbearing years, even all the way through menopause. I've also had men read it and tell me that for them it was the most hopeful thing they read about resolving sexual problems. Look for Wanting Sex Again on Amazon.com. You can also talk to Lori Watson for therapy in person or via Skype. I offer couples counseling and sex therapy and I think about both aspects of the relationship, emotional intimacy and sexual technique and that combination together helps marriages be happy. Improve your sex and improve your relationship with Awakening Center for Couples and Intimacy. Find out more at awakenloveandsex.com and sign up for their next couples retreat weekend hosted by Lori Watson. awakenloveandsex.com. Awaken what's possible. It is one of my great joys in life to be able to really help individuals and couples find strength in their relationships and really find hope again. Licensed marriage and family therapist, Dr. Adam Matthews from Matthews Counseling. I work with a wide variety of issues, including depression and anxiety, marital issues, issues with adolescence. I believe that therapy should be designed around you, that it should be personalized to who you are and to your unique situation. Therapy is available in office, online, and by phone. I want therapy to be comfortable for everyone. At our office, you'll find that we sit around a fireplace in deep, comfortable chairs, look at the problem differently, and offer practical solutions for you to take home and utilize outside of the therapy room. Schedule today and rediscover hope. You can find me on the web at matthewscounseling.net. Matthews with one T. You can contact us through email or phone and find a lot of resources on our website, matthewscounseling.net. So we're back and we're talking about the breakdown in paradise and kind of what does cause sex and relationship to be shut down in a toxic way. And, you know, I I talk sometimes about the emotional pursuer and the emotional distancer and the Mm -hmm. sexual pursuer and the sexual distancer. And what I mean is one person is usually the chaser. They're the ones who are aware of their need. I need something from you. Usually and they're going to the, go get it. Yeah, and the, right. And the distancer usually is not aware of their need. It doesn't mean they don't have the need, but they're not aware of it. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's it's often easier to see why the chaser, the pursuer, causes problems. You know, because mm-hmm. they get critical over time. They get angry. 
they get whiny and and demanding and give me what I want. And they're, they're usually the more verbally expressive. Exactly. You agree? Exactly. Yeah. And even if they're male and they're maybe more the sexual pursuer and they're not verbal in other ways, maybe in this way, they're mm. critical. Yeah. You know, like, why don't you want it? Why don't you, you know, this is, they get angry. There's something about it. That this would also be, they get stuck on one complaint. I would think a lot of times mm-hmm. too. So like what you're talking about is the complaint is going to be one note a lot of times and it's mm-hmm. going to be you you don't give me enough sex. You don't give it to me in the right way. Why aren't yes. you more sexual? And yeah. it's going to tend to be because they are expressive and they pursue their need, mm-hmm. their top need is going to, if it's not getting met, it's going to get a lot of play. It's going right. to get a lot of air time. Right. So to and, speak. and you know, the answer to that is you don't give me enough time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. You, know, you don't ever spend time with me. You don't ever respond to my bids. That's right. Right. I mean, really, a sexual pursuer needs to totally respond to their partner's bids. Mm. And, and I find that some people are whisperers. Mm. They don't bid very loudly. Oh, know? yeah. You know, especially when it comes to sex. You know, oftentimes a sexual distancer actually does have important things that they want to communicate about how they like it, Mm -hmm. but they whisper it instead of, you know, sort of giving it a loud enough airplay on it. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. that's right. And that that translates so well into, again, the the quote that we said in the very beginning by Sue Johnson, that it translates into the emotional world as well, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That conflict doesn't drive distancing in relationships, but that emotion, that partly that emotional shutdown does too. And so the one person who's emotionally pursuing, I mean, what do you think about this? I think there, I think we could make a case for that, that one may be sexually pursuing and the, the other partner may be emotionally pursuing. Usually. And there's, Usually. And so there's I, I conflict I find there. that stereotypical in a heterosexual relationship. Yeah. One corners the market on sex and the other on sort of emotional connection. Yeah. So if one's pursuing sex and one's pursuing emotion, they're going to reach a standstill, right? Yeah. They're I mean, I, I think in, in these situations, honestly, it's good news. Because mm-hmm. there's, they both want something yep. from each other. Yeah, it's more when one person says, "I don't want sex, and I don't really want much connection with you." That mm-hmm. is harder. Yeah, uh, much harder. Yeah, I mean, you got to start be able to start speaking the other person's language there. Yeah, right. The emotional distancer has to ha- can't shut down emotionally. They I have mean, to start being I, open yeah, enough I emotionally. Think the emotional distancer or the sexual distancer doesn't see what they're doing that causes the dynamic to go offline. So like the emotional distancer who's sitting there at the table, not responding to their partner saying, hey, look at that cardinal or, mm. or do you want some eggs or yeah. what's going on with you? And they just like don't respond. They don't really see that as doing something bad. Yeah. They see that as, well, I just I didn't hear you or I was lost in my thoughts or you know, you always rattle on and on. They they don't see the negative, but they actually are forming a vacuum. Hmm. They're forming a vacuum by their silence and their withdrawal that pulls their partner to them in just the way they don't like it, right? Because, hey, did you see that, Carnell? Do you want some scrambled eggs? Nothing, nothing. And it's like, you know what? You never talk to me. Yeah. And And the partner is just like deer in the headlight, the withdrawing partner. Like, what did I do? It's yeah. what you didn't do. Yeah, it's what you didn't respond to that is often the problem, right? And, and you know what I, I think people don't understand is that in that the pursuer then begins to form all kind of reasons in their head about why this behavior is ha- is not exactly. happening. Exactly, because that that vacuum is such a great idea, Lori, because it, it's it's so vivid. Because you can see how all of a sudden their words are kind of echoing all around, and yeah. they're coming back to them. They're oh, going to make it up. That person, the, my partner, doesn't want to talk to me. They exactly. must hate me. They, they, their love has probably dropped for me. They don't like me anymore. Exactly. Um, and on and on and on that it could go to some really far out ideas. Mm-hmm. I mean, that goes on long enough, and pretty soon you're thinking, well, maybe they have somebody on the side. Yeah. You know, especially maybe. the sexual withdrawal. Yes. You know, if if your partner is a sexual withdrawer mm-hmm. or a distancer, just like you said, it's like maybe they have someone on the side. Yeah. Maybe they're not attracted to me. Mm. Maybe I failed. I think there's a lot of then like Maybe guilt. I'm a crappy lover. That's right. You know? Uh, that's right. <laughs> I'm crappy in bed. They're not, yeah, I mean, and, big one. And then it starts to turn into something that I think is even more dangerous as it starts to turn in, well, they're never going to change. They've uh-huh. been this way. If it goes on long enough, they've been this way for so long. They can't change. That's just who they are. Mm-hmm. Our marriage is is done with. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I think that people don't realize how they trigger the dynamic. Mm. 
I mean, it's so easy to see what our partner is doing. If if you look at your partner and you say, I am married to a mega withdrawer, I am married to a mega distancer, it's like, mm. guess what? Look in the mirror. Yeah, that's because right. Because that means you are a mega pursuer. That's right. You are mega critical. Yep. And and or vice versa, right? If you think, oh, my partner nags me to death, they're always after me, they're always unhappy with yeah. me. Guess what? You're withdrawing. Yeah. You know? I, I've had so many couples in my office where the one that is the pursuer, their chief complaint is that is obvious is what we've been talking about that their partner doesn't talk to them, mm-hmm. right? But they're almost every time it is without fail, their partner tries to talk in session and gets interrupted I by the pursuer. It. I it's know so, it. That is so it's true. It's so crazy. And I'm, I like I know that that like it seems like that should be obvious <laughs> yes. that if you are interrupting your partner all the time and your chief complaint is that they don't talk to you, maybe you should stop interrupting just, them. Just shut up. But, you know? <laughs> but I, call, I I tend to say that they're they are sucking all the air oxygen. Yes. out of the room. Yeah, you're right. And so the, their partner can't respond. Or, or they correct their partner or they try to teach mm-hmm. their partner how they ought to say it. Or they, Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that is just like we've I've had many conversations just this week about trying to get people not to make moves to try to change their partner in this way. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I think if either way, either if the pursuer is trying to get their partner to talk more mm-hmm. or or have sex more or the distancer is trying to get their partner to leave them alone. Mm-hmm. For a little mm-hmm. while, or just do something different. Mm-hmm. Both, all of those moves are are going to fail. They're just playing mental chess with each other and trying to make moves rather than talking directly about what's going on. Yeah, and I think in the partnership there comes this point, right? It's about control. It's like you're going to want me to be totally different. Hmm. You're never going to be happy until I'm just like you. Oh. I have to come all the way your direction in order to make this better. You want me to be a completely different person. <laughs> a total paradigm shift. You don't love me for who I am. Fundamentally different. <laughs> yeah, that one I came up like several times in the last couple of weeks. You yeah. want me to be fundamentally different. I'm like, you know what? Actually, what she wants is just two orgasms a week. <laughs> you, you can be the exact same guy. I swear to you. Same guy. Just give her two or- I'm. I like was boiling it down for him. Seriously. Yeah. Okay. Like, like how long does it take to give her an orgasm? And he's like, and I don't, he, he was a guy who didn't have any desire for a variety of reasons. I'm like, how long does it take? He's like, I, I don't know, you know, maybe two hours a week. I'm like two hours a week, dude. And this fight goes away. Hmm. And he's like, but I'm not prompted. I don't want sex. I'm like, I'm not talking about you wanting sex. Hmm. I'm talking about giving her what she's asked for. Hmm. I mean, I, I don't get it. When a partner asks for something really simple, it's like, why can't you just give them what they want? Yep. You know yeah. how to make an angry woman stop being angry? Yeah. <laughs> give her what she wants. Yeah. And the emotional, on the emotional side of that too, I've had somebody say this week, she, want, she wants me to be with her 24 7 every every hour of every day she wants it to roll around her <laughs> she i said the exact same thing i said no i said what she wants is for before you make any other plans this week right. you plan some time with her I think exactly. it was two hours, like one night a week you dedicate to her. And what would be lovely, right, is if he actually called her up and said, hey, I'm looking at my calendar. That's right. I want to get some time in with us. Mm-hmm. You know, Friday night, Saturday night, what's the best for you? Yep. Oh, and of course, bonus points if he says, I'll call the sitter. But I, I don't know if men ever say that. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm yes, sorry. Yes, yes they do. do. Yes, they okay. do, Lori. <laughs> they call the sitter occasionally. I'm really in trouble for oh, my Oh, my goodness. Yes. Thank you. Slap my hand. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> there are some. <laughs> okay. Cough me. Cough. <laughs> That call that I'm call the that center. You. I know others, <laughs> but no. I mean, I think I think from a, a male standpoint, I think one of the things that is very common to say that complaint that I hear from guys is that their wives get upset when they want to go out with yeah. the guys. Uh-huh. Sure. And I think that's what uh, again told somebody that this week. If you would just plan one night mm-hmm. that is just dedicated to her, she's going to let you go. Right. And, and, and she's I not going to she's not going to complain about yes, you going and being with the guys. Yes, and absolutely the same complaint. When the partner says, all my partner wants is sex. Mm -hmm. They want sex all the time. And it's like, okay, if you know they want sex all the time, how much effort have you made to give them sex some of the time? Yeah. And and what happens is the shutdown and the power struggle is I can't meet that need, so I won't meet any of it. Ah, yeah. 
I, I won't do the things that are right in front of me that I know might make it a little bit better because it won't be enough. Yeah, that's the distancer's responsibility. Yes, right. Absolutely. I mean, the distancer's responsibility because what happens is when that complaint gets loud enough, they just don't do it at all. Yeah. Even a little bit, and so it just it just goes away. Right. Exactly. So my question for you, the question for you out there, listening audience, is: Are you a distancer? Or are you a pursuer? And just for the record, on awakenloveandsex.com, basically we have a quiz that helps you identify whether or not you are a sexual pursuer or a sexual distancer and whether or not you are an emotional pursuer or emotional distancer. So it's on our front page, awakenloveandsex.com. And just come and take that quiz. We don't capture the data. We do capture your email, and then you'll get my newsletters and all that. But you can you can give me Mickey Mouse email if you want. I just want you to have this information. I think it's important for us to say, too, being an emotional pursuer, sexual pursuer, or a sexual distancer, emotional distancer, those are not good, bad terms. Those are not good, bad. You're not, right. One is not more desirable than it's the other. It's tendencies. And yeah. you have a unique challenge, whichever side you land on. Yeah. Right? The pursuer has to stop the criticism and contain their own anxiety. And the distancer basically has to initiate and feed their partner. Yeah. Those are the challenges. It's information, everybody. Yeah. Information that's helpful. So our question, which one are you? Pursuer, distancer, and in which way? Thanks for listening. For Play Radio Sex Therapy with Lori Watson, sex therapist, and Dr. Adam Matthews, couples therapist. Hey, help us stay on top here at Foreplay. We'd love it if you would subscribe and share it with your friends. And please take one sec and rate and review us. Thanks so much.